confronting uh, new nuclear dangers. That's uh, more or less the theme of this uh, annual conference of Pagwash, which is a 60-second conference taking place in the Astana. Uh, not long after the United Nations adopted a resolution prohibiting nuclear weapons. So how do you think, what are the new dangers, new nuclear dangers? Well, the immediate new nuclear danger is this nuclear confrontation between the United States uh, and, and North Korea. But the older continuing nuclear dangers are from 15,000 nuclear weapons that exist in nine countries and 90% of this 15,000 nuclear weapons are in the hands of the Russians and the Americans. And in addition to this, we have nearly 2,000 tons of weapon-usable nuclear material, mm -hmm. which is good for 130,000 nuclear weapons. So in, you've heard about the nuclear security summits. Yeah. The very first one was uh, organized by President Obama in Washington in 2010. Then we had one in Seoul in 2012, uh, in The Hague in 2014, and the very last one. Washington. in Washington in 2016. Mm -hmm. And you know, a big hoopla was made about these nuclear security summits. But they only addressed 17% of the world's nuclear materials, which are in civilian use. 83% of the world's dangerous nuclear materials are in military use. It's a staggering figure. Uh, yeah. yeah, and they are completely outside any international monitoring, verification, or accountability. Mm -hmm. We have no government figures as to how much each of these countries has, uh, but there are good estimates. And as I mentioned, it's 1,500, 1500 tons, mm. which is 15,000 kilograms of um, 1,550,000 mm. kilograms of uh, highly enriched uranium. And it takes 25 kilograms to make one Hiroshima-sized bomb. Uh -huh. And we have 500 tons, which is 5,000 kilograms of plutonium and we only need six kilograms of plutonium to make one nuclear bomb. So here we have these four nuclear security summits but they didn't deal with this mm -hmm. material which is good for 2,000, sorry, which is good for 130,000 nuclear weapons and if this material is direct use material, so if a terrorist mm -hmm. or a non-state actor were to get hold of it it could be used in an improvised nuclear device. Whereas mm -hmm. nuclear material from nuclear power reactors is not that dangerous as this material mm -hmm. is. But was there a design behind that that didn't, didn't, didn't talk about this? Well, it's because the, the material in the military stocks is hidden behind the shield of uh, secrecy and classification. I see. Yeah. They don't want to let their adversaries know how much material they have and what is its isotopic composition. Is it also because they want to prevent <clears throat> the terrorists to know the figures and they might find No, ways? at one point in, in the Clinton administration, the U.S. actually declassified all the figures and the locations where nuclear material was stored and you can still find it on the internet. Oh. Yeah, but the precise composition of the nuclear material is regarded as secret by each country with nuclear weapons because once you know the exact composition, from that you can deduce mm -hmm. the design of the nuclear warhead, mm -hmm. which each of these countries wants to keep secret so that the other side doesn't know how the weapon is designed. Although we know the physics of nuclear fission and the physics of mm -hmm. thermonuclear weapons, mm -hmm. but still they want to preserve um, the uniqueness of their design. So what's the way to go about with <coughs> Well, one way is to negotiate a new agreement in Geneva, mm -hmm. which is called the FMCT, you would have yeah. heard about this. Mm -hmm. This is a, a verifiable treaty to ban the production of nuclear material for nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. But such a treaty doesn't make any sense unless we also bring in the materials that already exist mm -hmm. that are usable for nuclear weapons and this is this 2,000 tons that I was just mentioning. Mm -hmm. So the, most of the Western countries only want to prevent future production. Mm -hmm. They don't want to deal with the existing stocks of this material that they have already. Mm -hmm. uh, so politically at the moment one country is 
is preventing the start of negotiations, and that is Pakistan. And yeah, it's Pakistan, a point of debate between India yes, and Pakistan. and the Pakistani yeah. position yeah. is that yeah. uh, they would be prepared to negotiate a treaty banning further production of weapon-usable nuclear material, provided existing stocks are also brought under international monitoring and verification. Mm -hmm. uh, but hiding behind the Pakistani coattails are China, Russia, Israel, Egypt, Iran, and others. Mm -hmm. So the Pakistanis are getting all the diplomatic blame for preventing the start of negotiations. Oh, mm -hmm. But the Chinese and the Russians say, well, we don't want a negotiation on an FMCT unless we have a parallel negotiation on a treaty banning weapons in space. This, mm. is, this is called PAROS, P-A-R-O-S, Prevention mm -hmm. of an Arms Race in Outer Space, because uh -huh. they are very concerned about U.S. Uh, emerging capabilities to put weapons in space. So these would be weapons that would target targets on Earth from space. Uh, um, which is prohibited by the United Nations. Huh? Um, no, the outer space? The, outer space treaty prevents stationing of nuclear weapons in space or testing uh -huh. nuclear weapons in space. Uh -huh. But it doesn't prevent putting a weapon in space that shoots a laser, for example, on a ground-based target. I see. Uh -huh. And the uh, Indians uh, and Egypt, for example, say, well, we will not negotiate an FMCT unless we have a parallel negotiation on a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And so you, at the start of this discussion, mentioned this new treaty on the prohibition yeah. of nuclear weapons that was yeah. uh, agreed in New York on the 7th of July this year. Yeah. But those negotiations and that treaty is boycotted by all nine countries mm -hmm. who possess nuclear weapons. And the recognized international forum for negotiating arms control treaties is not New York. It is the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Mm -hmm. So that is the other criticism that is leveled against this new treaty, that it was not negotiated in the correct forum. I see. So that means there's no big reason to be happy about this uh, UN uh, no, uh, I think adoption. there is reason to mm. be happy that mm. we, 122 countries, mm. have taken the first step, even though all countries possessing nuclear weapons have denounced this treaty, mm. have boycotted its negotiations, and uh, the French, the British, and the United States issued a press release mm. condemning this treaty and stating that they would never, ever, yeah. as a direct quote, mm. sign this treaty. But it shows how worried they are about this treaty and the norm mm. that it will set. So for the proponents of this treaty, this is like the first steps to ban slavery, mm -hmm. uh, to, to ban um, uh, chemical weapons, uh, the mm -hmm. Geneva Protocol of 1925. Mm -hmm. So it does serve an important purpose. But if it would have been taken up in Geneva, then the conference disarmament has been blocked for several years. It yes. never reaches any decisions. That's right. So that's mm -hmm. the reason that the proponents mm -hmm. didn't go to the conference on disarmament, which mm -hmm. is composed of 65 countries, mm -hmm. and each country has a veto. So we were just discussing Pakistan. So Pakistan mm -hmm. is exercising its veto mm -hmm. in the start on the start of FMCT negotiations, mm -hmm. which is why they negotiated this treaty in New York under the rules of the General Assembly. And the rules of the General Assembly call for decision-making by majority vote. Yes. This yeah. is a way mm. of overcoming mm. the vetoes, so to speak, the in, the, and, uh, in the yeah. Conference on Disarmament. Yeah. It's not the P5, it's any one of the 65. Uh -huh. But in the Security Council, in you have the P5. Council, P5. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Mm. But when you do it in the General Assembly, mm. then this is the assembly of all the countries of the world. Yeah. And it, it makes its decision by consensus. If consensus is not possible, then they take a vote, and it's usually a simple majority. Mm. So 122 countries, there are 195 Three. or mm. 93 members yeah. of the United Nations. Yeah. Mm. So 122 is a significant majority. Mm. And I argue that this 122 reflects the will of the international community. Mm. And I personally object to the use of the term when, for example, the Security Council adopts a resolution against a country and they say that is reflecting the will mm. of the international community because yeah. the Security Council is only 15 members. Mm. Of the 15 members, five are the permanent five members. And this is uh, China, France, United Kingdom, Russia, and the US. And these five countries 
are history's greatest proliferators mm. of nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and the biggest purveyors of conventional weapons. Mm -hmm. So this is like giving the robbers the key to mine the store. Mm -hmm. Of course, they, they don't like them being described the way I did. Yeah, yeah. But I just mentioned to you that there are 15,000 nuclear weapons, uh, of, of which uh, the five permanent members have the biggest majority. Mm -hmm. um, they, it was Russia, uh, United States, and others that possessed chemical weapons, which they have now destroyed mm -hmm. and are destroying. Mm -hmm. uh, they also did research on biological weapons. Mm -hmm. Who is the world's biggest exporter of conventional weapons? It's the United States which actually single-handedly exports more weapons than all other suppliers combined. Mm -hmm. So these are the five countries in the Security Council that is laying down the law on controlling weapons in other countries. So for me, it has zero credibility. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, this is, um, there are other challenges too. For example, the CTBT, it has yet to enter into force. Yes. And some people say if it existed already, if it was in force, then North Korea would not be able to uh, come up with all these nuclear tests. And then, on the other hand, we, we also have uh, um, the, the issue of where do we go from after this uh, treaty, which has been adopted on July the 7th, mm -hmm. uh, enters into force. I'm sure it will enter into force because it's a question of uh, how many? 50. 50. So, but even if it enters into force, what happens then? Mm -hmm. So these are part of the existing challenges. Mm -hmm. no? So coming first to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Mm -hmm. It was first proposed in the early 50s mm -hmm. by the then Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. Mm -hmm. Actually, he also was the person who proposed the fissile material cutoff treaty that we were discussing. Mm -hmm. But at that time, the, because of the Cold War race between the Soviets and the Americans, uh, and also the British, there was no interest Mm -hmm. in pursuing a comprehensive uh, nuclear test ban treaty. Mm -hmm. So this treaty was eventually negotiated in 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was part of the agreement that the nuclear weapon states uh, reached to get the uh, non-proliferation treaty indefinitely extended in 1995. Mm -hmm. And uh, even after the 1995 indefinite extension of the treaty, China and uh, France continued to do nuclear tests because the Soviet Union had suspended voluntarily nuclear weapons testing in 1990. Mm -hmm. The United States suspended nuclear weapons testing in 1992. Mm -hmm. And because the British do their nuclear tests in Nevada, if the US is not doing nuclear tests, the British couldn't do nuclear tests. Mm -hmm. But the French, and the, Briti uh, French and the Chinese resumed testing in 1995 and they were roundly condemned. And so under international mm -hmm. pressure, they also backed off. Mm -hmm. um, so. At that time in the Conference on Disarmament, there were 40 countries. We just thought that there are today 65, but mm -hmm. then it was 40 countries. Mm -hmm. And um, we just talked about the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which has, never, which has not been signed by Israel, India, and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, and so when this Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was being negotiated, uh, the British, I am told, came in with the position that they would not join a treaty where India and Pakistan were not members. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were also reported to have said that they wouldn't join a treaty where former colonies of theirs were out of it. So you can see how this played particularly with mm -hmm. the Indian delegation. Mm -hmm. So the Indians said already then that we will never sign this treaty. So because of the rule of consensus in the Conference on Disarmament, the Indians vetoed the adoption of the CTBT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was then taken by Australia to the General Assembly mm -hmm. in September. Mm -hmm. the, the, in the General Assembly, it was uh, approved by a majority and opened for signature. Uh, but the British and their supporters had their revenge. So they came up with the entry into force formula that is very unique. Mm -hmm. So we just mentioned that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons requires 50 mm -hmm. signatures and ratifications to enter into force. But it doesn't say which 50, it can be any 50 countries. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. The Non-Proliferation Treaty entered into force after 40 countries mm -hmm. signed and ratified, plus the three depositories, the US, Soviet Union and the US. Mm -hmm. 
But the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty requires the ratification of 44 countries. But the, the 44 countries are named. I see. Which means mm -hmm. we have 44 vetoes. Mm -hmm. So um, there are now eight countries of the 44 that have to sign and or ratify for the treaty to enter into force. So mm -hmm. India, Pakistan and North Korea have not signed the treaty. Mm -hmm. um, China, United States, Iran, Egypt um, and Israel, they have uh, signed the treaty but, not ratified. but they have not ratified. Mm -hmm. um, and this situation has existed now for the past several years. And yeah. It's now a domino, so mm -hmm. some people say, well, if the United States ratifies, then China would ratify. If China ratifies, then there's a good chance that India would do it. If India does it, then Pakistan would do it. Mm -hmm. um, the other domino is if Israel does it, then Egypt and Iran would do it. Mm -hmm. Nobody has come up with a domino where North Korea would do it yet. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the big challenges now, is how to break this deadlock. Mm. to get these remaining eight countries because it is now 21 years mm. since the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was opened for signature. It has been signed by 188 countries. 92% mm. um, of the monitoring system is already established the yeah. mm. at the cost of more than a billion dollars mm. of money paid by the member states. Mm. And this international monitoring system is composed of um, 330 one stations all over the world, all the way down to the tip of South America in the middle of the ocean on mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. So the nuclear tests, now North Korea is the only country that has uh, carried out nuclear tests in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And with each test, more of these stations are coming online. So we have a very good picture mm -hmm. of the size of the North Korean tests. Mm. So it shows that the verification system is working. Mm. But the holdup for the treaty is not for technical reasons, it's for political reasons. Mm. Do you think uh, things uh, might look better if uh, there is a uh, uh, Middle East uh, nuclear weapon and uh, WMD free zone? Well, the, some people say a Middle East nuclear weapon free zone uh, would be established. It's just like, you know, asking for, um, what is the term, taking a snowflake into hell. So at the moment, nobody can envision any prospects for a Middle East zone. Mm -hmm. uh, the Israeli position is, first, there needs to be peace in the region. Mm -hmm. Israel needs to be recognized by all countries in the region. This peace in the region needs to prevail for several years for confidence. Then Israel could think about giving up its nuclear weapon capability. Mm -hmm leading to a zone free of nuclear weapons because all other countries in the Middle East are party to the non-proliferation treaty committed not to make nuclear weapons. The position of the Arab states and Iran is that if Israel were to give up its nuclear weapons then peace would follow and then they would recognize Israel. Mm. So these are two polar opposites and there is no room for compromise. One side or the other has to complete this sort of a zero-sum situation here unfortunately. Except to hope that uh, things might get better. <laughs> well, I hopes think Middle East last. and South Asia are two places where, you know, even South the best Asia. of hopes are extinguished <laughs> quite quickly. Yes, that's uh, what I experienced yesterday in the debate mm -hmm. at the, in the panel, you know, between yes. the Indian and the Pakistani. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, thanks very much. Uh, it has been very instructive to talk to you. Thank you. And our listeners will also uh, know what they didn't know until now. Thank you very yeah. much. It's a pleasure. Thank you.